Gotham's law-breaking taxi drivers, the Overlook's reality-bending layout, and Alicia Silverstone's hilariously genuine mispronunciation. Keep watching for some of the best movie mistakes that made it into the final cut. A good soldier fights through peril and injury, and apparently, so does a good actor. You've probably heard of a number of performers who do their own stunts, but George Mackay never expected one particular scene from the 2019 war film 1917 to put him on that list. While his character's grueling sprint at the end of the film was undoubtedly an intense climax to his mission, the actor wasn't meant to take any hits as he ran across the battlefield. He had come out of rehearsal for the scene unscathed, but there are no guarantees of timing in such a complex scene. On the actual day of shooting, as Mackay told Jimmy Fallon, he found himself taking multiple blows from a slew of oncoming soldiers, despite never having rehearsed the shot that way. Yeah, well, well that, that's like that's a mistake that made it in. That wasn't meant to happen. But an actor keeps going until the director calls for a cut. And for such an important moment in the film, he knew he couldn't throw in the towel himself. So he kept moving, and director Sam Mendes never halted the take. He must have realized that, despite deviating from rehearsal, something even more intense was happening. The shot that was never meant to happen ended up being one of the greatest triumphs of Mackay's performance. While filming The Princess Bride, Carrie Elwes convinced Christopher Guest to hit him on the head with the pommel of his sword in a scene. I swear it will be done. This action was scripted, but the issue arose because they apparently didn't have a rubber prop sword to do the deed harmlessly. Elwes thought it would turn out fine if they just used a real one. Of course, he expected his co-star to give him a gentle tap. Certainly not the level of bludgeoning you'd rather have a stuntman step in for. But Guest apparently didn't know his own strength. It's part of the story for Elwes's character, Wesley, to get KO'd, so you might never have known the actor had really been knocked unconscious if not for an interview Elwes gave to Sundance TV describing the incident. He said that the next thing he knew, he was waking up in the hospital. The blow actually ended up creating a literal slapstick comedy moment that made it into the film and served its trademark zaniness incredibly well. Every job has its hazards. If you work in a kitchen, you run the risk of slipping on spills or burning yourself with hot cooking oil. If you work in an office, you might get carpal tunnel syndrome. And if you're Channing Tatum, portraying Olympic wrestler Mark Schultz in Bennett Miller's 2014 film Foxcatcher, you might break your hand, pop your eardrum, and cut your head open. All of these injuries actually befell Channing Tatum during the shooting of Foxcatcher. He broke his hand while training for the role, but you can see the other two mishaps during the film. When Mark Ruffalo's character roughs up Tatum's and clips him on the ear, you see Tatum wince. His eardrum actually popped in this moment. And when Tatum slams his head into a mirror, the cut you see on his head in the film is real. The actor went a little too hard in the moment and actually broke through the wall behind the prop glass. So, when you see the intensity of Channing Tatum's physical reactions in Foxcatcher, you're often seeing something all too real. Perhaps his most telling line from a Variety interview on the subject? Eardrums heal, so I'm fine. Sometimes you do the spit take, and sometimes the spit takes you. Or something like that. This mistake in The Martian is another case in which part of the action was scripted, but a mishap actually elevated it to the next level. The Martian is directed by Ridley Scott, a sci-fi legend who's apparently known for getting scenes done in just a few takes. This is opposed to the dozens of attempts that other directors might often employ to get things just right. His films are said to be full of banana peels because if someone accidentally slips and messes up or eats it, as Donald Glover puts it, the clumsiness just makes it all the more real. Scott prefers this humanizing element, so he doesn't bother doing the scene over just because someone tripped, and you'll often see such unscripted stumbles in his films. In this particular instance, a nervous Glover slips and falls on some spilled coffee that he himself had spit out earlier into a wastebasket. He gets up, saying he's fine, and stays in character to complete the scene. The spitting out was scripted, but the slipping was not, so Glover was quite surprised when, after the scene, all Ridley Scott had to say was, that was great. Actors like Channing Tatum and Donald Glover didn't have to go to the hospital for their injuries and slip-ups, but some performers weren't as lucky. Brad Pitt's character in David Fincher's Seven actually had to be changed to accommodate his arm injury, which he sustained during a chase scene. 
He accidentally put his arm through a windshield after a scripted fall from a fire escape. The star even required surgery for this wound. From that point on in the film, Pitt's character is always wearing a cast, which required Fincher to alter many other sequences in the movie to accommodate the injury. These scenes weren't just the ones that, in the film's chronology, came after the chase scene. After all, movies don't always shoot their scenes in the same order as they appear in the story, so there were a lot of scenes from before the chase that hadn't been shot yet, and Fincher had to hide Pitt's arm in these moments to disguise the injury, as it hadn't happened yet in the world of the story. In film, just because something is unscripted, that doesn't mean that it's a mistake. Some directors are pretty strict about improvisation, while others encourage it. On the actor's end, some improvised moments work much better than others, but even the ones that don't go over well are typically conscious acting choices, not accidents. In the case of this sequence from Captain America the First Avenger, you could say it was an improvisation and that'd be partly true, but it still definitely qualifies as a mistake when you hear Haley Atwell tell it. In what Vanity Fair describes as your favorite scene in Captain America, Atwell's Peggy Carter sees Chris Evans' super soldier serum-saturated Steve Rogers with his shirt off for the first time. She reaches out in awe and seemingly involuntarily touches his chest. But this wasn't only Peggy's first time seeing Steve shirtless, it was also Atwell's first time seeing Evans shirtless. The actress said that she was compelled to impulsively touch Chris Evans' chest, and the director apparently thought it was so organic that you can see it in the film. By her account, it was less of a choice in character and more a compulsion in the moment as herself. Practically an accident, but what a happy accident it was. Atwell, for her part, claimed that it was the highlight of her life. If you think that being in the background of the film means you're missing out on all the action, that's not necessarily the case. Sometimes you get even more action than you bargained for, and it's not always a pleasant or star-making experience. But you can rely on the eagle-eyed film enthusiasts of Reddit to eventually get you the recognition you deserve for taking a background blow like a champ. Blink and you'll miss it. But when Tom Cruise dismounts his horse in one scene in The Last Samurai, the steed kicks an extra in the crotch. You can tell from his reaction that it wasn't some sort of stunt, but once you see it, it's all the more impressive that the extra remains standing and, though he stumbles a bit, takes it like a true warrior. What's most alarming is that no one around him appears to flinch when it happens or check to make sure that he's okay. If you want to believe the best, you could read the lack of response as evidence of the stoicism of the soldiers. Either way, the injured soldier is a true champ. Imagine your first chest waxing and your first leading role in a film occurring at the very same time. It sounds like it'd be a lot of pressure and that things could potentially go really badly. That's exactly what happened to Steve Carell. His character in The 40-Year-Old Virgin, Andy, is trying to get into the dating world for the first time and, as the title of the film suggests, lose his virginity. He gets a lot of advice from some pretty questionable but well-meaning sources which ultimately leads to him booking a waxing appointment. Oh, that sounds like it would be nice. Normally a scene like this would be done with makeup and special effects, but Carell thought it would be better if the waxing was real. He assumed it wouldn't hurt that badly, but you can tell in the scene itself how shocked he is at his miscalculation. The pain is real. To make matters worse, the actor who played his waxer lied about being experienced in the procedure and apparently skipped an important protective step, that is, applying Vaseline to his nipples. Poor Steve. The master of physical comedy really went to his limits this time, and thankfully it's not completely embarrassing. Rather, it's a hilarious and memorable scene, and the film wouldn't be the same without it. Have you ever noticed that in many scenes in the MCU movies, Tony Stark is munching on some sort of snack? It's easy to believe that it's just part of his character. He's quirky in many other ways and always does whatever he wants. So why should the end of the world keep him from snacking? Well, apparently this habit was never part of Stark's character in the beginning. Robert Downey Jr. would just hide snacks all over the set and randomly start munching out during takes without telling anyone he was going to. There was nothing anyone could do about it since they never knew when it was going to happen, so the production just made constantly eating and drinking a comedic part of Iron Man's cavalier character. And honestly, it fits just fine. Is it a mistake? 
It would have been for a lesser actor, as it likely would have gotten them fired or at least heavily reprimanded, but RDJ took his snacking and made a meal out of it. A series of mistakes in Titanic turned out to be a blessing in disguise. Believe it or not, Jack's now famous exclamation at the tip of the ship wasn't originally in the script. In fact, he and director James Cameron had tried a bunch of different lines in its place and they all fell flat. Time was running out and the production was losing light. But finally, after a bunch of mistake lines, an exasperated Cameron told DiCaprio to just say, I'm king of the world. And apparently DiCaprio really didn't want to at the time, responding to Cameron's direction with an unconvinced, what? And repeating the question when Cameron reiterated his instructions. To the second objection, Cameron simply replied with, quote, just sell it. I'm the king of the world! We're eternally grateful that the previous scripted attempts turned out to be mistakes. Mistakes that, in their wake, made room for one of the most recognizable lines in one of cinema's most revered films. We'd love to know what some of those failed lines were, though. When the futuristic bat vehicles dominate the screen in the Dark Knight trilogy, most people really aren't paying attention to much else. But if you check the traffic in the background, there are quite a few scenes in which Gotham citizens don't appear to be obeying traffic rules. These sequences usually occur in high speed, quickly cut chase scenes, so they're easy to miss and, if we're being honest, a little nitpicky to point out even if you do catch them. Still, the other drivers on the road as the caped crusader rides his bat pod after the Joker are blatantly ignoring streetlights. Of course, the taxi drivers who nearly crash into the bat pod and honk as he whizzes through them are most likely stunt drivers given how close they come to colliding with him. Not to mention that these near encounters were great to emphasize the peril of the chase, but if you look closely, the lights facing left and right, where the vehicles come from, are red. These collisions should have never happened. You could nitpick and say it ruins the realism, but we disagree. The whole premise of Nolan's trilogy is that Gotham is a city of debauchery, mayhem, and moral bankruptcy. There's often explicit debate as to whether it can be saved. We naturally conceive of that in epic cinematic terms. Grand-scale sociopaths like the Joker, corrupt officials at the highest levels, and sky-high crime rates. But if Gotham truly is a lawless city, wouldn't that extend to every area of life? If people aren't going to follow the law when it comes to fraud, murder, and greed, why would they when it comes to traffic? Many injuries are the result of talented, invested actors taking their scripted scenes a little too far. It's a testament to their acting that they're willing to risk bodily injury in order to fully inhabit a scene, but we hope they don't make a tradition out of needing stitches. In Nightcrawler, Jake Gyllenhaal plays a freelance photojournalist named Lou who enters the competitive business of covering violent incidents like crashes and crimes and selling the footage to news stations. Naturally, he develops an unsettling obsession with his work and uses increasingly questionable means to obtain the most compelling footage before any of his competitors. This means going so far as to tamper with crime scenes and manipulate police, journalists, and criminals. It goes without saying that the guy is intense. At one point, he punches a mirror, which was part of the script. Jake Gyllenhaal needing stitches in his hand afterward, though, that was not part of the plan. Even still, it all fits incredibly well with a seedy character who will go to any lengths to get what he wants. You might have been told as a kid that sugar can make your teeth fall out, but for one young extra in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, this threat became all too real in an unexpected way. When confectionery magnate Willy Wonka announces his golden ticket sweepstakes, it inspires a frenzy as people everywhere flock to candy stores in hopes of finding a ticket. In one scene, a crowd of children clamor at the counter of a sweet shop. The proprietor, while singing the now famous The Candyman tune, graciously invites the children behind the counter to select their treats. But if you watch closely, he almost knocks one little girl's teeth out. This moment hasn't been spoken about in interviews, likely in part because the film vastly predated internet discourse on such subjects. But it's a very small chance the sequence was scripted or directed this way. You can see from the clip that the little girl actually gets clocked by the fold-up counter. 
It's pretty safe to assume that they didn't plan for this and then bring a six-year-old stunt girl on set to get nailed in the face. What makes this goof so perfect, though, is how the little girl doesn't seem phased at all. She still rushes past the counter to get at the candy. It makes her seem so hilariously invested in the treats that she doesn't notice getting hit on the chin. And she won't be the last child in the film whose dogged pursuit of sweets gets her into trouble. While it's also full of all the sweetest things in life, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory has more than one mistake hidden under the wrapper. And one continuity error in this film accidentally makes a pretty powerful statement. When the malnourished Charlie eats what's probably his first ever Wonka bar, we see him take a bite in one shot while his mouth is already stuffed. But in the next shot, just a couple of seconds later, his mouth is totally empty. You can't swallow almost an entire chocolate bar in a matter of seconds. It definitely can't be done without making a mess or at least needing to catch one's breath afterwards. At first glance, this is an extremely minor continuity error. And again, since this is a viewer-caught slip-up in an old film, it hasn't been addressed as a mistake by anyone connected with the feature. We're just deferring to the laws of physics here. But on that note, this mistake can totally be spun as the whimsical film's magical realist take on just how ravenous Charlie is for the first ever taste of Wonka chocolate in his impoverished life. The layout of the Overlook Hotel in The Shining, Stanley Kubrick's film adaptation of Stephen King's disquieting horror novel is spatially impossible. If you try to match what you see inside the hotel with what you see on the exterior, there's simply no way to make it work. But when you think about the story itself, everything about the sinister, seemingly sentient hotel defies logic and is meant to confuse the viewer and occupants and drive them slowly mad. So why not the architecture itself? Some people staunchly argue that The Shining set features many impossibilities, from windows that shouldn't exist, doors that lead nowhere, to entire rooms that couldn't possibly fit inside the hotel. Others, however, say it's all part of Kubrick's genius, and that the hotel itself is clearly a supernatural disorienting force, an illusion in and of itself in many ways. It would certainly lend new and unsettling meaning to the now famous sequences of Danny riding his tricycle through the Byzantine twists and turns of the hotel's hallways. He may be wheeling in and out of reality. Self-absorbed Cher, living up to the title of the film Clueless, mispronounces words throughout the movie. But what you might not know is that actress Alicia Silverstone herself is making these errors. Whenever you hear her articulate a word slightly wrong, there's a good chance that the mistake is genuine. Apparently, after Silverstone had made a few mistakes in the debate scene, members of the Clueless cast and crew attempted to help her out by correcting her. However, director Amy Heckerling called for everyone to stand down. She felt that mispronouncing Haitians as Haitians is something Cher's ditzy and self-absorbed character would totally do. So, if the government could just get to the kitchen, rearrange some things, we could certainly party with the Haitians. And she was absolutely right. Cher's mispronunciations serve as foreshadowing for the growth she will experience over the course of the movie. That is, from the selfish, ignorant girl she once was, to the conscientious, caring person she always had the potential to be. And these competing elements wouldn't have been expressed as well without those delightful mispronunciations. Bloopers are just a part of doing business when that business is show business. Actors are bound to mess up a line every now and then, or after a long day on set, improvise and make their co-stars laugh. While most of these flubs and goofs are innocent, some are downright raunchy. For example, Full House. Has there ever been a more innocuous TV show than Full House? The often sickeningly sweet sitcom used its ah track almost as often as its laugh track. But two of its cast members were veteran stand-ups, both quick on their feet and even occasionally pretty filthy. In this blooper, Dave Coulier really lets Bob Saget have it, but apologizes to another character off camera. You can really see how little your <laughs> is in that suit. <laughs> sorry, Patty. <laughs> sorry, Patty. I'm sorry, Bob. <laughs> Sorry, Patty. Friends. The friends of friends were, well, friends. And when people are that close both in friendship and proximity, there's bound to be the occasional bit of accidental nudity. It's even a plot line that was actually scripted on friends at least a couple of times. But this is not one of those times. Oh, whoa, one hand on the cheek, Joe. Oh, hey, oh sorry, gotcha. You saw it, didn't you? <laughs> I saw it. 
The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air In this blooper from the otherwise classy sitcom The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Colton is supposed to be concentrating really hard, but he looks like he's doing something else. So somebody in the sound booth sweeten the shot. Go on, try it. <laughs> the Soupy Sales Show Soupy was a beloved kiddie TV host in the early days of TV. But one day, his crew surprised him in the middle of a taping with an R-rated special guest behind an onset door. And right now, let's have a couple of commercials. 30 Rock Will Arnett had a recurring role on 30 Rock as Devin Banks, a nefarious and sometimes predatory NBC executive with his eye on the innocent page, Kenneth. His flirting could get a little creepy and alarming, such as when he force-fed Kenneth a bottle of apple juice and Arnett's riffing got a little too out of hand. God, your mouth is so thirsty. <laughs> Such a thirsty mouth. Better Off Ted this quirky ABC sitcom aired for just two seasons, but it quickly became a cult hit for its surreal and twisted take on office culture. In one episode, a typo in a memo requires, rather than discourages, employees of the show's workplace to use offensive or insulting language. This led to some pretty insane outtakes as the actors and writers kept trying to one-up each other. Here's just a sample. I'm terrible at insults. I can help you, you mouse-humping piece of <laughs> I can help you, you sweaty thong and a hooker's money crack. Could you repeat that in English? I don't speak the language of the square-jawed puppets. Parks and Recreation A tremendous cast of comedy all-stars kept things loose and improvised from time to time on the set of NBC's small-town government comedy Parks and Recreation. But Chris Pratt in particular had a difficult time not crossing the line, such as in this scene where the gang pretends to be old people to better empathize with them. When I sit down to do my dirty business, my gonads hangle in the water. <laughs> Sorry about that. They hangle in the water. <laughs> TV is a whole lot better than it used to be. Over the past decade or so, so-called prestige TV has offered audiences superb acting, cinematic style, unpredictable storylines, and an epic scope never before seen on the small screen. Many of these shows are serious, sometimes devastating dramas with important things to say. But even brilliant productions like these crank out plenty of ridiculous and hilarious bloopers and outtakes. Breaking Bad Child actors are unpredictable, and the younger they are, the more unpredictable they can be. But productions only have a limited time each day to use babies, so they can't wait around for when the baby feels like acting. Especially since they don't really know they're acting. Nor do they care. Take this Breaking Bad outtake, for example, in which the infant playing Holly White makes some very interesting choices for her character. The kids, they, they, they are safe. Of course they are. <laughs> I don't think she feels very safe. Game of Thrones in this blooper from HBO's fantasy epic Game of Thrones, Kit Harrington plays the corpse of Jon Snow, his body laid out on a table for what will ultimately be his spooky resurrection from the dead. Snow is supposed to be naked in this scene, with only a modest genital concealing garment preventing anyone on set from seeing little Jon. <laughs> Deadwood so many gag reels consist of actors forgetting their lines and swearing up a storm. But what happens on a show like HBO's gritty western Deadwood, in which half of the dialogue is already swearing? The actors simply burst into a song. Or at least that's what happens when apparent Rolling Stones fan Ian McShane can't remember what comes after a line that includes the words, start me. Don't start me. Oh, don't start me. Oh, start me up. Hey, and you start me up, you whip me up, you put me down. Sons of Anarchy There's a lot of platonic male-on-male -male affection on Sons of Anarchy, especially in the form of backslapping bro hugs. But while shooting one of the show's many action sequences, actor Ryan Hurst overestimates how far he needs to move and winds up unusually close to his fellow gun-toting, cover-seeking co-star Charlie Hunnam. <laughs> what do you want for Christmas? Hannibal Brian Fuller's artfully gory television adaptation of Thomas Harris's Hannibal Lecter novels featured many scenes of its central cannibalistic serial killer intricately preparing gourmet meals in his beautiful kitchen. 
A lot of that was likely achieved through the magic of editing, because in this blooper, actor Moss Mickelson can't quite master the show offy knife skills that would be second nature to the character. Ended it in the 19th century. Criminal Minds Despite the gruesome subject matter of Criminal Minds, it looks like the cast and crew keep things pretty light and loose on set. He's no longer with the show, but Thomas Gibson seemed to have a pretty good time while he was starring on the long-running CBS crime procedural, like the time it took him a comically long time to put a pair of rubber gloves on. You know, your prostate is the, about the right size for a man your age. <laughs> Law and Order SVU When you're making a long-running crime series about the most appalling of crimes, allowing yourself to laugh here and there on set is a good way for actors to cope with the depressing material. Case in point, former Law and Order SVU star Christopher Maloney can't get over how funny it is and how utterly creepy he sounds to ask a suspect for something rather unusual. Would you mind if we took a DNA swab from inside your mouth? Even I felt creepy. <laughs> Would you mind if we took a DNA swab from inside your mouth? It'll help us. Even I, I felt creepy again. <laughs> ER the hit NBC hospital drama ER made George Clooney a superstar, and not long after, he became one of the biggest movie stars on the planet. He also had a unique way of coming up with some dialogue in the event that he forgot a line while filming the incredibly fast-paced show. I'm gonna try something. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to think of, think of me with no clothes on. Would you just shut up and kiss me? Kiss me. Orphan Black. Tatiana Maslany plays many different clones on Orphan Black, but they're all pretty different. For example, Alison Hendricks is a high-strung type A kind of person, Sarah Manning is a self-sufficient and streetwise rogue, and the Ukrainian clone Helena always seems to have really bad things happen to her. In this scene, there's a scorpion that's supposed to be crawling all over Helena, but Maslany just can't keep it together. Inside of <laughs> One more time. <laughs> In the 1990s, Jim Carrey became one of the biggest stars in the world thanks to hit films like Ace Ventura Pet Detective, Dumb and Dumber, The Mask, and Liar Liar. He's an incredibly likable actor and also a very loose performer. He improvises a lot, so when you combine that with his manic energy, it results in lots of unexpected moments of him cracking up his co-stars. And himself. Here are some behind-the-scenes clips from Jim Carrey movies, outtakes so good that they could have been in the movies themselves. Almighty then. Bruce Almighty is a high-concept blockbuster where Carey stars as a TV reporter who gets to take a crack at being God. In this blooper, an agitated Bruce has to cut off a conversation because he's running late for work. Generally, actors who have to drive in movies don't actually drive. Instead, the car is placed on a rig so that the crew can control exactly where it goes. This outtake reveals that secret as Carey fiddles with the controls and pretends to zoom out of the neighborhood. <laughs> Poppin' with the Penguins Mr. Popper's Penguins stars Carrie as a guy who opens up his apartment to dozens of the tuxedo-colored polar birds. For many of the shots, the production used real penguins, and they've got genuine comedic chops. In this outtake, Carrie attempts to establish comic rapport with a prickly penguin who reluctantly obliges. First, the bird completely ignores his attempts at friendliness. Then, when he attempts the old it's for you bit with a phone, the little critter amusingly snaps its beak as a clever retort. I'll, I'll introduce you. Somebody wants to talk. Want to say hi to Pippi? Yeah. Oh, yeah! Water in the Court In Liar Liar, Carrie plays a sleazy lawyer who is physically unable to say anything but the truth. Ironically enough, in this outtake, the joke is based on a lie. After an exchange with co-star Jennifer Tilly, Carrie pours himself a glass of water from a pitcher. He knows that neither the glass nor the pitcher is going to appear on screen, but that the sound will register. So it's the perfect opportunity for Carrie to make it seem like he's relieving himself in the courtroom. Ah. <laughs> Something about Merry Christmas. In this moment from Dumb and Dumber 2, best friends Harry Dunn and Lloyd Christmas are having one of their little arguments. In the outtake, Carrie adds some highly theatrical laughing. His co-star, Jeff Daniels, doesn't break character, instead managing to improvise this line. 
projector. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Okay. Let me just laugh some more. No. Because I can't remember my line. Something about merit. It's a joke that works on two levels, referencing both the name of Lloyd's unattainable dream woman from the original Dumb and Dumber, as well as another very successful Fairly Brothers film. Hello, Clarice. Carrie departed from his wheelhouse of likable idiots in the 1996 dark comedy The Cable Guy. He plays a TV installer who befriends a regular guy and then stalks him and tries to ruin his life. One of the movie's most famous scenes takes place at medieval times. Carrie puts a bunch of meat on his face and references Hannibal Lecter from The Silence of the Lambs. It was apparently so funny to Carrie and Matthew Broderick that they struggled to film the scene without cracking up. Silence of the Lambs! Stop that. That's incredibly disgusting. Do I have a lot of grease on my face? <laughs> yes. Fun with Jim and props. Jim Carrey knows a thing or two about physical comedy, but that doesn't necessarily mean he's the most physically coordinated actor. In this outtake from Fun with Dick and Jane, Carrey's suburban dad turned criminal is supposed to celebrate a successful phone call by throwing the phone from one hand to the other, but he can't quite seem to pull it off as he drops the phone and sends it flying. When he actually does manage to catch it, he pauses to savor the moment, but for so long that the take is unusable. A series of fortunate riffs. A series of unfortunate events is based on Lemony Snicket's gothic children's novel about the orphan Baudelaire children. With Carrie as villainous master of disguise Count Olaf, there ended up being plenty of extra footage. In this clip, he improvises a song about a time machine. That leads him to imitating a clock gone mad, which then leads to his top-notch dinosaur impression. Somehow, his co-stars continue to pretend to sleep even as he runs around and, well, does this. What's my name again? Anchorman 2 did everything the first Anchorman did, only much bigger and set in the 80s instead of the 70s. This included revisiting the first film's epic news anchor battle royale. The original fight featured only local San Diego news teams, while the second increased the stakes with national and international squads. There were cameos galore, including Carrie and Marion Cotillard as a Canadian duo. Though Carrie is a native Canuck, his character's exaggerated accent made it hard for him to spit out his lines. What the hell's my name? Scott Ryan. Scott Riley. There's not gonna be a fight without Ron. What's my name? My name is not Ron. Scott Riles. Whether he's playing a Jedi or the director of S.H.I.E.L.D., Samuel L. Jackson always follows his instincts, and those instincts are often funny. We're gonna seal off this <laughs> Sometimes, though, his jokes aren't entirely on purpose. That leads to some outrageous bloopers and outtakes, both for himself and his co-stars. Here are some times when he cut loose. Nick Fury is a serious, serious man. Samuel L. Jackson, you know, not so much. But the guy is such a professional, he manages to keep it serious even when everyone else around him is screwing up. Why am I going over here? To see him on the thing and tell him, you know, But why did I do don't that? Don't be going all stealth mode, mother we can't I see you. The 2017 action flick The Hitman's Bodyguard gave fans a chance to see Deadpool and Nick Fury together at last. Well, at least the actors who played them. So it's no surprise that there were a lot of casualties in the film. What is a surprise is that there were some casualties behind the scenes as well, such as this poor dude. <laughs> poor Mace Windu. He should have been the ultimate hero, but instead he got blown out a window thanks to Anakin's betrayal. At least Jackson was able to have some fun with it, though, filming it over and over again while pretending the safety mat was a big, comfy mattress and his death was just a bad dream. Oh my god, I'm awake! <laughs> it's morning! Even though he's known for playing a guy with one eye, Jackson seems to have amazing peripheral vision or something, because in this blooper from Triple X The Return of Xander Cage, he seems to know exactly what's happening behind him. Because soldiers are built to take orders and fight wars. But we, my friend, are not oh, cut, at cut. war. There's war behind us. It can't be easy for Maria Hill, the deputy director of S.H.I.E.L.D. under Taskmaster Nick Fury. And it can't be easy for actress Kobe Smulders either, as, like Fury himself, Jackson is always watching and ready to pounce on any screw-up. I got confused with my eyeline. I think I looked directly into camera. I don't care. You just forgot the line. Now you're trying to make up some other in the 2003 action flick SWAT, Jackson plays a Los Angeles Police Department sergeant tasked with putting together an elite force. 
but only if he can keep his balance first. I heard some rumors about you and your old partner. <laughs> <laughs> Just like in SWAT, Samuel L. Jackson plays a tough-as-nails cop in the 2010 comedy The Other Guys. And like in SWAT, gravity is his downfall. That's in the fact that co-star Dwayne The Rock Johnson seems to have no idea what Jackson is doing. Whoops. Tuck and roll when you hit. Ah! Oops. <laughs> For all the blood-pumping brawls, sentimental scenes, and general doom and gloom seen on screen in Avengers Infinity War, there was just as much laughter, banter, and goofs that played out behind the scenes. And thanks to the Blu-ray release of Infinity War, which features a two-minute long gag reel, viewers at home can witness the best of those bloopers in one handy spot. Something wrong with Wong. After Bruce Banner crash lands at the New York Sanctum following his cosmic face-off with Thanos, he meets up with Iron Man, Wong, and Doctor Strange. Wong and Doctor Strange give a crash course on the Infinity Stones. Bruce explains just how wicked Thanos is, and Iron Man goes to call Captain America for help, hoping to reconcile after the falling out in Captain America Civil War. But when Iron Man notices that the wind has picked up, the four men slowly turn to face the Sanctum's street-side door and realize that Thanos' lieutenants have already touched down on Earth. Pretty dramatic stuff, right? Well, during filming, actor Benedict Wong couldn't really keep it that way. <laughs> Bumbling Benedict and Mushmouth Mark They may be two of the smartest characters in the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe, but for a few minutes during filming Avengers Infinity War, Doctor Strange and Bruce Banner definitely acted like a couple of doofuses. When Bruce and Doctor Strange emerge from a portal and greet Iron Man and Pepper Potts in the park, actors Benedict Cumberbatch and Mark Ruffalo seem to forget how to, like, talk and stuff. I'm Doctor S I'm Doctor I Can't Walk at the moment. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Falcon gets funny. Anthony Mackie's Falcon wasn't as major a player in Avengers Infinity War as some of the other superheroes, but a lack of narrative influence doesn't equate to a lack of quality bloopers. During the battle in Wakanda, Falcon soars through the sky to take down the Black Order and the Outriders. Between takes, Mackie made sure to paint a great mental picture for everyone of what his scene would look like when the movie was finished. Flying about 80 miles an hour. Just a big chocolate missile. When shooting another portion of the Wakanda battle, Mackie had another important acting moment, this time with co-director Joe Russo. Hey, Russo, you want me to go Jamie Foxx on this one? Oh, sh Everybody put on your sunglasses. Denzel's coming out. And that wasn't the only time Mackie discussed his acting process between takes. During the film's intense final sequence, Falcon rests slumped on the Wakandan forest floor. It's a heartbreaking moment for viewers. Turns out it's because Mackie was channeling his Infinity War co-star Don War Machine Cheadle for inspiration. I'm going full Cheadle on this take. Oh, shit. Don't give him full Cheadle. Full Cheadle. Black Panther versus the Bleeding Goats. Poised yet passionate and undeniably powerful, Chadwick Boseman's T'Challa, better known as Black Panther, is generally able to keep his cool under even the worst of situations. This rings especially true in Infinity War, when Black Panther gifts Sebastian Stan's war-weathered Bucky Barnes a new bionic arm and subtly asks him to join the resistance against Thanos, whose Black Order was minutes away from landing in Wakanda. This one may be tired of war, but the White Wolf has rested long enough. Upon seeing his upgrade, Bucky and Black Panther have a simple, dramatic exchange. Where's the fight? On its way. The blooper reel features an extended version of this moment, which is less dramatic. The problem? A couple of extras just couldn't keep quiet during filming, specifically two chatty goats. I know you have found something. A sense of peace. Okay, now you are going too far now. A hairy situation. Nearing the third act of the film, Black Widow, Bruce Banner, Captain America, Scarlet Witch, Falcon, War Machine, and Vision all travel to Wakanda to visit Shuri, the genius younger sister of T'Challa, who's known for advanced technological creations like the latest version of the Black Panther suit. The group hopes that Shuri can safely and successfully remove the Mind Stone from Vision's forehead, and that they can destroy it before Thanos seizes it and uses it to power the Infinity Gauntlet, snap his fingers, and kill half the universe. 
Once in the lush, futuristic country, the heroes wind up preparing to battle the purple-muscled despot, with Black Widow joining the fight inside a ship alongside Wakandan warriors and members of the Dora Milaje. Like so many scenes throughout the film, this sequence was shot in front of a green screen, but also required the use of a machine to simulate real wind whipping past, and the machine kind of worked a little too well both in this scene and in one starring Elizabeth Olsen as the Scarlet Witch from earlier in the film. Because you're worth it. If they ever get tired of acting, Johansson, Olsen, and the rest of the Infinity War cast could totally do shampoo commercials instead. No matter what other movies or TV shows Mark Hamill makes, he will always be synonymous with one role, Luke Skywalker. That's just bound to happen when an actor's breakout gig turns out to be the lead role in the original Star Wars films. Star Wars fans love Hamill for being a part of their favorite movies, but he's also one of the most accomplished voice actors in Hollywood. Surprise! <laughs> In addition to bringing dozens of characters to life, Hamill is also a funny and fun-loving guy. These bloopers from behind the scenes of his films prove it. Training Day When Star Wars first came along, nobody had ever seen anything like it, including the cast and crew. With all kinds of ridiculous costumes and sci-fi props to work with, things tended to get a little silly on set. Well, hello. <laughs> And it only got worse when they started playing around with lightsabers. <laughs> While we've had the luxury of decades to make fun of lightsabers, Mark Hamill and director George Lucas had to create those iconic moves from scratch. He'd certainly never waved a laser sword around before, so the process of him learning how to do it in these outtakes makes him look very uncool. But it still packs a lot of charm. Super what? Star Wars is a science fiction movie set in space with lots of ships, star bases, and alien races, which means it's loaded up with lots of made-up jargon. As Luke Skywalker, Mark Hamill certainly got his fair share of mumbo-jumbo mouthfuls, basically from the beginning. But I was going into Toshi Station to pick up some power converters. That's in the medium range of difficult slang, but in this blooper from Star Wars, Hamill has a hard time getting down a simple line that's laced with just one space word. Now let's get some distance before that thing goes... Now let's get some distance before that thing goes supernova. How do you pronounce supernova? What inflection? Supernova or supernova? No lines, no problem. In 1994, Mark Hamill took a break from his usual roles to star in the space simulator game Wing Commander 3 Heart of the Tiger. The game was one of the first to make full use of the then cutting edge technology of full motion video, which put Hamill front and center in most of the cutscenes. <laughs> You haven't lost your touch. Wing Commander 3 featured over two hours of that kind of thing, which meant a lot of time in front of the camera for the actors. Considering the nature of the project, it's no surprise that things could get a little out of hand. I'm ready to add to that legend now that you're here. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same old <laughs> again. To his credit, Hammer was a consummate professional throughout the whole thing, even when he couldn't remember his lines. We've got to be on our guard. I don't know my line, but I want everyone to think I do. <laughs> Barely scripted. Mark Hamill also shows up from time to time in interesting indie movies such as Brigsby Bear, a dark comedy about the strangest and most mysterious kiddie TV show possible, co-written and starring Saturday Night Live's Kyle Mooney. Hamill plays Ted, the father figure of Mooney's character, and also an evil human-faced sun god on the show within a movie, Brigsby Bear Adventures. Hamill is barely recognizable in the part. However, his voice and sense of humor are immediately familiar when he starts riffing funny things to say. Calm down, bro. You're being hella weird. Like anyone, the stars of the MCU mess up sometimes, and the cast of Captain Marvel was no exception. Despite seasoned actors and Oscar winners filling the movie's roster, lines were forgotten, blocking was totally bungled, and goofiness got the best of the stars more often than you might think. Brie Larson carried the weight of Captain Marvel on her shoulders and spent months preparing to play the high-flying heroine as best as she possibly could. She devoted hours of her days to working out in the gym, stuck to a strict diet, and even visited the US Air Force Academy for some up-and-close personal priming. But when Larson acquired all that newfound strength, knowledge, and know-how, she apparently lost an important basic skill. Multiple times during filming, Larson got mixed up on the direction she was supposed to go and what she was meant to do with her body. 
Where are my other hand supposed to go? I don't know. Larson again gets directionally confused while filming a fight scene with Talos actor Ben Mendelsohn, who also could have used a helping hand in the blocking department. The two rehearsed their tussle one way, but when they got in front of the cameras, everything was backwards. Other side! Get on the other side! I know we rehearsed it this way, but it's this way now! Because the best things come in threes, Larson tops these shenanigans off by barreling down a hallway, before realizing that she's running in the wrong direction. Rarely do actors nail a scene in one take. Their performance may be spot on, but the lighting might be totally wonky. Maybe the set design is impeccable and the mood exactly right, but the line delivery isn't seamless. Like we said before, no one in the movie industry is immune to mistakes. For the Captain Marvel crew, though, one scene didn't just have a single hiccup, it went wrong in almost every way imaginable. The sequence in question is the one in which Brie Larson's Carol Danvers, Ben Mendelsohn's Talos, Samuel L. Jackson's Nick Fury, and Lashana Lynch's Maria Rambo escape from the Kree Warriors and the Star Force Squad in pursuit of Marvel's hidden laboratory that served as a refuge center for displaced scrolls. On screen, the scene was flawless, but one take turned hilariously disastrous. We're talking rogue kitten, lighting mishap, whole cast breaking character disastrous. Look at this unbridled mess. <laughs> Worst take of anything that's ever happened. Worst? Maybe? Most hilarious? Oh, you bet. If you thought the blooper featuring a real cat playing goose was rib tickling, there are plenty of silly outtakes that find the cast interacting with a fake feline too. One take shows Samuel L. Jackson looking half sad, half bemused, to find out he's shooting with a standing cat, especially since he keeps getting fur on his nose. In another, Lashana Lynch can't keep it together while Jackson holds a faux goose and keeps talking to it as if it was a real deal. Good kitty! That's not all the feline fun the actors had on set. In a third outtake, Brie Larson's Carol throws a prop cat at Ben Mendelsohn's Talos, who is deathly afraid of Goose since the cuddly creature is actually a shape-shifting, pocket-dimension-holding alien known as a flurkin. When she tosses a kitty at Talos, well, see for yourselves. It's an <laughs> Remember that scene in the film where Phil Coulson and Nick Fury team up to find out what the heck is going on after Carol Danvers crash lands on Earth? You know, after she destroys a blockbuster and brings back a pack of scrolls trailing behind her? You'll recall that the dynamic duo was attacked by scrolls, and it's soon revealed that the Coulson sitting in the passenger seat of Fury's car isn't the S.H.I.E.L.D. rookie at all. He's really a scroll who shapeshifted into Coulson. The two fight for control of the steering wheel, with Fury ultimately winning when he deliberately crashes the car and kills the scroll. That scene might have been wild to watch, but the process of filming must have given the cast and crew a heaping helping of headaches. If this version of the same scene is any indication, of course. Oh. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's okay. No, it's not. We aren't privy to their medical histories, but judging by the Captain Marvel gag reel, it looks like both Brie Larson and Ben Mendelsohn might have a serious case of sweaty palms. Larson and Mendelsohn continuously drop things during shooting, ruining takes, but showing that beneath all those flashy prosthetics and CGI effects, they're just as human as their fans. The outtake reel finds clumsiness getting the best of Larson while filming the scene in which Carol Danvers retrieves a tesseract from Marvel's laboratory orbiting Earth. Ah, you broke it! Slippery Fingers played Mendelssohn when he was trying to perform a cool trick with Talos' scepter. He can be seen tossing it up in the air ever so slightly, but having trouble grabbing hold of the darn thing when it comes back down. Each time he attempts to move, Mendelssohn fumbles and the staff falls to the ground. After bleating repeatedly, <laughs> And dropping his props over and over again on the Captain Marvel set, Ben Mendelsohn brought his silly streak to an end with a rousing rendition of the 1960s tune Release Me, apparently because he was worn out from filming and just wanted to rap for the day, peel off his facial prosthetics, scrub away all his green scroll makeup, and relax. After he ends a take, Mendelsohn declares a dramatic tone. Thank you very much, good night. When no one answers back, he starts singing the opening lines of 1966 track popularized by Engelbert Humperdinck because why not? Please release me. No. Let me go. No. Not happening. Despite that not happening, this round of shooting inevitably ended with Mendelssohn's wish finally being granted, and he was indeed released. We're just happy that on this particular day, he let his golden voice be heard. No matter the movie, Chris Evans always seems to be having a good time. Something made clear by the outtakes, behind the scenes footage, and bloopers he's left behind. Here are some times when Evans just couldn't keep it together while shooting a scene.
Edgar Wright's Scott Pilgrim vs. The World is a triumph of comedy and sci-fi, and the whole thing feels like a video game without coming across as campy. To be with his dream girl Ramona Flowers, Scott must defeat her seven evil exes, including Lucas Lee, a former skateboarder turned gravelly voiced macho movie actor. Wright enlisted actual action star Chris Evans to play this fictional action star, although Evans is probably not as aggressive, frightening, and toxic as Lucas. Take for example this moment on set, when Evans is supposed to be threatening Scott and instilling deep fear in the underdog. That's kind of hard to do when you keep losing your train of thought and forgetting your dialogue. You are a pretty good actor. I'm more than pretty good. That's not the line. <laughs> I'm not that good. Long before Chris Evans and Scarlett Johansson joined the Avengers, they'd already worked together twice in the 2004 college heist film The Perfect Score and the 2007 adaptation of the best-selling novel The Nanny Diaries. The future Captain America played Hayden, an upper-crust Upper East Side Harvard hottie love interest for Johansson's nanny. The character might be cool and calm, but Evans certainly isn't. He has a tough time with wordy mouthfuls of dialogue. And as soon as we get any closer to that building, he won't be... He wound up blaming his troubles on loud noises outside of the camera's view, as well as the fact that there were half a dozen people running straight at him. Solid excuses. Two most powerful objects in comic book lore have to be Mjolnir, Thor's mighty hammer, and Captain America's nigh invulnerable shield. As seen throughout hundreds of comic books and almost as many Marvel Cinematic Universe movies, Cap's shield gives Mjolnir a run for its money. Its unique steel and vibranium composition allows it to absorb impact and energy alike. If Captain America ducks behind it, under it, or over it, he can keep himself safe from pretty much anything in the universe. This blooper, captured on the set of Captain America The Winter Soldier, shockingly revealed the only thing so powerful that not even this impeccable weapon and piece of protective gear can make it bend to its will. A door. <laughs> that shield is just a prop, and it doesn't give Evans the oomph he needs to bust down the big door. Chris Evans just can't seem to get a break, props-wise. Did he accidentally offend someone in the Marvel Studios' prop department? Did he skip acting with Props Day in drama school? For whatever reason, there are even more bloopers involving props not cooperating with the guy who just wants to play Captain America with proper gravitas. To his credit, Evans gives it his all. You need a plan of attack! This backpack is the greatest villain Captain America has ever faced or will ever face on screen, it seems. It wriggles its way out of Evans' control over and over again. In Spider-Man Homecoming, Evans' Captain America makes a cameo appearance, starring in a short educational film that Peter Parker watches in school. It's an arrangement that makes sense. If any Avenger is going to film a public service announcement to remind all the boys and girls out there to eat a nutritious, balanced lunch, it's Captain America. He's a product of the 1940s, when such ah oh, shucks, gee whiz kinds of PSAs for movie serial and radio stars were the norm. Of course, this is all so ridiculous that not even Evans can get through it with a straight face. Hi, I'm Captain America. Whether you're a student or a soldier, there's one thing that will always give you an edge. A hot lunch. <laughs> it's a super dramatic, pivotal moment in Avengers Age of Ultron. In a commanding, everybody pay attention tone, and with cohort Black Widow at his side, a suited up, ready for battle Captain America boldly intones, Avengers, but then stops. It's like he's waiting for a dramatic musical stinger. The audience is waiting for an assemble to finish the catchphrase, but it never comes. Avengers! It would seem Evans was pausing for effects before delivering the classic line. He was probably just messing around for fun, because he quickly turns the moment into a goof, and the movie itself cuts to the credits before the line finishes. Acting isn't the most physically taxing or mentally draining job in the world, but it's not without its challenges, particularly when the job is acting in a superhero movie. Playing Captain America involves a lot of physicality for Evans. He's had to do one-on-one -on -one fight scenes and tightly choreographed group fight scenes, pretended to operate vehicles, dangled from wires, and taken on villains in front of a green screen. He also has to run a lot. Captain America is always running to dull out good old-fashioned American justice to bad guys. In this take for a pulse-pounding scene for Captain America the Winter Soldier, Cap and Falcon quickly hoof it up to where they need to be, but in the wrong direction. How do we know the good guys from the bad guys? We're supposed to be running! 
This Avengers moment is all about sheer chaos. A climactic, apocalyptic battle rages, resulting in death and destruction. These moments are among the toughest for a film crew to commit to celluloid, as there are so many moving parts involved in getting it just right. That also means the chance for something to go wrong is much higher than it is for a simple, straightforward scene. In this instance, one Chris or the other is the thing that goes wrong. His Captain America lays on the ground, a leg awkwardly hanging in the air above him, awaiting a cue from co-star Chris Hemsworth. Oh, is Thor coming in? <laughs> but since Evans is the one laying there in the foreground of the shot, he's the one who has to take one for the team, and he does it with a laugh. There's an old saying that advises performers to never work with children or animals. After all, they both lack the self-control of adult humans, and if they don't feel like working, they just won't. Here are some films in which animals wreaked havoc while the cameras were rolling. Mr. Popper's Penguins Jim Carrey loves to goof around on the set, riffing on lines, making outrageous sounds, and teasing co-stars. Oh yeah! Honk! 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 It's all part of the Jim Carrey package, but if he messes around a bit too long, not all of Mr. Popper's penguins are gonna put up with it. I'll, I'll introduce you. Somebody wants to talk. Want to say hi to Pippi? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This way. Okay. You know what? Sometimes we need a little... Hey, come here. Come here. No? Outlander. This historical TV series is full of serious, dramatic moments set on the battlefields of 18th century Scotland. But behind the scenes, certain actors march to the beat of their own drum, and go by their own schedule. Take, for example, the horse who didn't feel like waiting until the scene was finished to take care of personal business. Oh yes, quite enough. The Lone Ranger Disney's attempt to reboot The Lone Ranger was also an attempt to revive the old-school big-screen western. As a result, Army Hammer and Johnny Depp spend large portions of the movie on horseback. All that time together led to what looks like an on-set romance, or at least a crush. I love you. You have traveled, but you have traveled far. Okay, don't come. See if I care. Mark the murders. <laughs> Anchorman In this ridiculous classic Anchorman, Will Ferrell's character, Ron Burgundy, winds up a shell of a man located in, well... I'M IN A GLASS CASE OF EMOTION! And it's all because he threw a burrito out the window and hit a biker, who responded by punting Ron's beloved dog, Baxter, off a bridge. But behind the scenes, it appears the actor playing Baxter could sense the danger ahead. Cause I will give you a rap on the Jack Johnson! Speak. You hear me? Speak! Alright, now this is gonna happen. Yep, he doesn't like you. <laughs> Anchorman 2 The beginning of Anchorman 2 shows Ron getting the old news team from Anchorman back together. He finds Paul Rudd's character, ace reporter Brian Fantana, working as a highly esteemed kitten photographer. But some on-the-set tension between the models may have led to some, well, catfights. Oh. 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 The Interview German Shepherds are one of the most fearsome breeds of dog, liable to maim, murder, and dismember if they're trained that way, or apparently that rage can be redirected. Unfortunately for Seth Rogen in the interview, the scenes he shot with an extremely friendly German Shepherd also required nudity. <laughs> <laughs> The Hangover Dogs are essentially professional people lickers. While filming The Hangover, Zach Galifianakis established a very special bond with a dog named Tucker. Although, it doesn't seem like it was always the dog who was doing the licking. I've got so much peanut butter in my beard right now. <laughs> the Proposal You'd think acting opposite Oscar-winning movie star and America's sweetheart Sandra Bullock would get actors to behave professionally and keep a laser focus on their scene partner. Apparently, not all actors. Come on, you little... <laughs> Late Night with Conan O'Brien During a taping of an episode of his old NBC show in 2007, Conan O'Brien brought out a duck, without a plan as to what to do with it. Well, the duck had his own idea. And we don't even have an idea for him, I just like... The bit was so well received that O'Brien brought the duck back, naming him Quackers, the eating duck. 
It's a relatively cushy job that seems to pay pretty well, but that doesn't mean being a movie star isn't hard work. Multi-million dollar productions rely on an actor's ability to, you know, act. So there's a lot of pressure for them to do a good job, and not everyone is great under pressure. An actor will occasionally, for whatever reason, forget their lines, and they all flub in different ways. They also deal with the embarrassment differently, and oftentimes hilariously. Here are some famous actors who were caught messing up their dialogue. Lawrence Fishburne. Bathroom humor is the great human equalizer, be it the young and the old, the rich and the poor, or the smart and the dumb. Both Oscar-nominated and non-Oscar-nominated actor alike can get behind a good butt reference, which is precisely what happened on the set of the 2016 science fiction film Passengers. In a very wordy scene, Lawrence Fishburne, who plays the spaceship's chief deck officer, briefs supposed to be hibernating passengers Chris Pratt and Jennifer Lawrence on the craft's movements. He ends up giving us a lesson in space anatomy instead. Jupiter. Uranus, you name it. And then along came. <laughs> Bradley Cooper. Messing up lines will usually cause an actor to break character, laugh, lightly curse, get back to their mark, and give it another try. But some actors are just too cool for that. Um. Maybe not that cool. But Hangover actor Bradley Cooper can give us a master course on what to do when you flub your lines during a rooftop monologue. What happens here tonight may as well never happen, never happened, never happened. Just fake it till you make it, even if that means that you have to speak in gibberish. Christina Applegate. In Will Ferrell and Adam McKay's Anchorman, a silly spoof of a horrendously sexist 70s workplace, Christina Applegate plays the glass ceiling shattering news anchor, Veronica Corningstone. She faces open hostility from other members of the Channel 4 news team, including sports guy Champ Kind, played by David Koechner, and reporter Brian Fantana, played by Paul Rudd. Inside source tells me that the FBI has been called in to aid in this ongoing investigation. <laughs> Who am me? It would be hard for anyone to act under those circumstances. Paul Rudd. The comedy films of Judd Apatow maintain an almost impossible balance between strong, earnest characters and over-the-top ridiculousness. The 40-year-old virgin has its serious and heartfelt moments, but it's during one of these that Paul Rudd slips up while pronouncing the name of a famous painter. If you love Trish, you, you can't do this. But you gotta finish waxing your chest because you look like Ed Munch's The Scream. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Ben Stiller. It seems like pretty much every romantic comedy ever made has some variation of the don't get on that plain speech. And the 2004 Ben Stiller, Jennifer Aniston film Along Came Polly is no exception. When it comes time for Stiller to unveil his true feelings, he can't quite remember the specifics of this particular romantic monologue. When you go off to Tanzania or Cincinnati or wherever you're going, you... I guarantee you. It... Timothy Dalton. You gotta be smooth in order to play James Bond. And Timothy Dalton succeeded at being the ultra cool super spy for two movies back in the late 1980s. Years later, he took on the role of the villain in the Simon Pegg cop spoof Hot Fuzz, betraying his 007 image of calm and cool. I think the store's security footage will lose up. Mother. It. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, that's all mildly amusing. What happened next was golden. Still rolling. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 that's on the DVD. <laughs> Mila Kunis. In Forgetting Sarah Marshall, Jason Segel plays Peter Bretta, who is, as you could probably guess, trying to forget his old girlfriend, Sarah Marshall. Hey. You know what? She's a plain Jane, and hey. she should go back to where she came from. Hey. That is the mother of my. Oh, sorry. Peter Bretta retreats to a resort where he gets over Sarah with the help of a resort staffer played by Mila Kunis. Initially, Kunis's character has to call him Mr. Bretta, but she just can't seem to get it right. Hello, Mr. Brenner. Mr. Brayton. Bretter! I said Bretter! You said Brenner. You said Bretter. <laughs> 
Rob Riggle. In the real world, it's pretty absurd for one grown man to stare down another grown man and tell him that he's going to hurt him. It's doubly absurd to have to do this with a comedy legend like Will Ferrell. I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna drive it into your temple. <laughs> Prepare yourself for a fight, a fight that's coming. I, I don't want that. <laughs> Unlike Will Ferrell, we definitely want more. Harrison Ford. The explosion of the first Death Star is supposed to be a moment of triumph for Han Solo and the Rebel forces, followed by celebration and exaltations. All that celebrating is supposed to be followed by some lines, but Harrison Ford totally blanks on what those lines are supposed to be. <laughs> you! The... The... Eating your mic is definitely one way to go rogue. Everyone likes Paul Rudd. He might be the perfect movie star. He leads a hit Marvel franchise, yet he seems down to earth. He broke through in the classic 90s teen comedy Clueless before becoming one of the comedy cool kids with Wet Hot American Summer and Anchorman before segueing into superhero mode as Ant-Man. Rudd likes to laugh and keep it light, so it's no surprise that he generates a lot of bloopers. And to offer hilarious proof, we've taken a deep dive to bring you some of the funniest moments from behind the scenes of his biggest movies. Just some kid stuff. What makes little kids freak out, in a good way, more than anything else? Being present for stuff they think they're not supposed to see. For example, bad words. They've been told their entire lives that some words must never be said, so it only stands to reason that when they actually hear one, they become enthusiastically amused, like in this outtake from Ant-Man. Cuff that a**. You got it. I heard you. <gasps> I heard you! Why, robot? Judd Apatow likes to keep things loose and collaborative on his sets, and since Paul Rudd has an agile comic mind, he's wound up in a few of Apatow's movies, including The 40-Year-Old Virgin. His character works alongside Steve Carell's at a big box electronics store, which gives the actors plenty of opportunity to play with goofy gadgets. In this not quite appropriate for the final cut sequence, Rudd interrupts a conversation to show off a cool robot toy. Check it out, man, new Robo Sapiens. <laughs> Black Market Panther In Anchorman, a movie full of hilarious sequences, one of the best occurs when ace 1970s San Diego reporter and self-proclaimed ladies' man Brian Fantana shows off his stash of intoxicating colognes to Ron Burgundy. The prize of his collection? Sex Panther. They've done studies, you know. 60% of the time, it works every time. That doesn't make sense. In this outtake, the elaborate, panther-shaped mechanical prop doesn't work at all. And her ear fell off. This cost me $13,000. It really pisses me off. Knocking a few back to the future. Pretending to be intoxicated, improvising lines, and doing either of those things while a co-star is angrily yelling into your ear can't be easy. But Rudd manages all three of those tasks in this unused scene from Knocked Up. While his character gets progressively more drunk in a restaurant, he slurs and stumbles through some Back to the Future themed goofing. I'm gonna build, you know what, I'm gonna Please build you, talking. I'm gonna build you a skateboard. Stop I wanna talking. see what you do in the town square. Hey, you guys stop are gonna talking. love it. Can you hear me? In the future, trust me. I'm going stop to stop it! go to the Twin Oaks Mall. That's that used right. to be the Hill Valley. Hill Valley. <laughs> <laughs> Cracking up is only natural. The 2012 comedy Wanderlust concerns a big city couple so sick of urban annoyances that they decide to try life on a nature-positive, free-love, hippie-style commune. In this outtake, Paul Rudd tries to convince Jennifer Aniston that they need to give up the natural life. I don't think we're supposed to be in a place where people are hairier than Alec Baldwin's forearms. <laughs> Many apologies, Mr. Baldwin. Rolling right along. In the 2008 comedy Role Models, Paul Rudd and Sean William Scott play a couple of guys forced into community service. All that stress highlights the differences between the two, resulting in a fight which created a few unusable outtakes. This coming, this, 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 this coming from a guy who, who, who likes girls a whole bunch. <laughs> when to call cut. In 2010, Rudd starred opposite Reese Witherspoon in How Do You Know, where he plays a nice guy named George who gets caught up in a federal investigation of his father's company. He also finds time to fall in love. George is more than a bit nervous, and judging by this blooper, those traits seeped into Rudd's psyche. I'm gonna tell you exactly, I'm gonna lick, 
out everything that I have inside. Oh, kiss und kiss? <laughs> Nuts to you! What a schmuck. Dinner for Schmucks is an odd comedy about odd people. It stars Rudd as a guy caught up with a strange club that requires guests to bring an oddball along to regular dinner parties. His candidate is a weirdo named Barry, played by Steve Carell. While shooting one particular scene, things got slightly weirder than expected. Popcorn's ready. I was just, I was just microwaving some Hot Pockets. <laughs> Stranger Things has plenty of scares, but they're all laughs too. Some of the funniest moments were totally unintentional. Which actors couldn't stop laughing during takes? Keep watching for the best Stranger Things bloopers. In the Season 3 episode, The Caves of the Missing Lifeguard, Will, played by Noah Schnapp, decides to wake up his friends Mike and Lucas in a rather unusual way. Dressed in a purple wizard outfit, Will presses play on his cassette player, which, turned up to an annoyingly high volume, starts playing a funny medieval flute song. Annoyed by his circus act, Mike and Lucas beg Will to stop the music and let them be. And here comes a part that didn't come out quite right on the first try. Instead of saying, I have seen into the future, and I have seen that today is a new day, a day free of girls. Schnapp couldn't stop saying another version of the line. And I have seen that today is a new day, a day full of girls. <laughs> In one episode from Season 2, actor Caleb McLaughlin, who plays Lucas Sinclair, finds himself having to enter a classroom with his back slamming against the door, walkie-talkie in hand. Once inside, he's faced with having to answer to an angry elderly teacher for disturbing her class. As soon as McLaughlin turns around, he's greeted by an off-screen voice who asks if he hurt himself. Excuse me, miss? No. <laughs> Reset. <laughs> McLaughlin seems to be having the most fun during filming, and we all know that if you love your job, you'll never have to work a day in your life. In a beloved bit from Season 3 featuring Finn Wolfhard as Mike Wheeler and Millie Bobby Brown as Eleven, an extremely awkward and blinded by love Mike tries to tell the girl of his dreams how he truly feels about her. The scene takes place in a supermarket, where they're taking shelter from the looming danger that awaits on the outside, and has the two characters sitting on the floor face to face. Is this a rehearsal? We're rolling. We're rolling. Hell yeah. Hi, editors. And what editor wouldn't be happy about seeing a personalized greeting from Finn Wolfhard himself while sifting through hours of endless footage? Being tasked with containing the otherworldly events that transpired in the Stranger Things universe, we can all agree that Dr. Sam Owens is a man who carries a tremendous burden on his shoulders. In a scene from Season 2's Will the Wise, actor Paul Reiser enters a room wearing his glorious lab coat turns to actor Natalia Dyer and Charlie Heaton and is supposed to say, it's not very pleasant in here, is it? It's not very pleasant in here, it is. <laughs> no wonder this became one of the show's best blooper moments. After all, the man is a natural-born comedian. The character of Will Byers has engraved himself in our hearts as a soft-spoken, well-mannered, gentle boy who would never hurt a soul. Well, unless he was possessed by the Mind Flayer. In Season 2 episode The Pollywog, Schnapp and co-star Finn Wolfhard, who plays Mike, are staring down at Dustin's trap, worried about the very angry creature inside. There's a frightened look in their eyes. And in an attempt to express his shock, Schnapp tries to gasp. But instead, this is what came out. Route. Oh my god. <laughs> In Season 2's The Mind Flayer, Dustin Henderson, played by Gaten Matarazzo, finds himself having to run towards a ringing phone in order to pick it up and slam it back down on the receiver. But in one particular outtake, he fails to do so multiple times, smashing the phone against the wall while trying and failing to hang it up. Hey guys. <laughs> When Will Byers disappears and is presumed dead, Hawkins Middle School has a moment to say a few brief words in his memory. The scene takes place in the school's gym and has all of Will's close friends in attendance, but their grief is not shared by students Troy Walsh and James Dante, as they disrespectfully mock the boy who most people assumed has passed away. Mike decides to confront the boys for their behavior while the rest of the school is leaving the gym and pushes Troy to the ground. Troy then decides to attack Mike, but is stopped in his tracks by Eleven, played by Millie Bobby Brown, who uses her powers to make him pee himself in front of everyone. And that's when another kid takes the opportunity to make Troy the butt of the joke by saying, Dude, Troy peed himself. But that's not what we get in the blooper. Pissing himself! <laughs> Sorry. 
Struggling to keep herself together while being terrorized by the thought that she might never see her son again, Joyce Byers, played by Winona Ryder, often finds herself entering into a mode of hysteria. In season two, Joyce and Bob are facing two government officials in uniform. The authority figures are in full listening mode as the desperate mother loses her ability to construct a sentence, which is more the result of Ryder totally flubbing her line and grasping for the next word. In the season two episode, The Lost Sister, Eleven sets out on a quest to find a group of unruly outcasts, including a strange but powerful girl who's later unveiled as Carly Prasad, also known as Eight. Eleven meets up with Becky Ives to look through some files, hoping to learn more information about other children the Hawkins lab has experimented on. It's here that Eleven learns that Carly was kidnapped in England as a child. It's also here that Millie Bobby Brown got whacked over the head. Is in, the <laughs> in episode one of season three, Hawkins chief of police Jim Hopper, played by David Harbour, sits Eleven and Mike down in order to tell Mike that something has happened to his grandma. In the actual scene, which is somehow disturbing and funny in itself, Hopper says, Your mom called. She needs you home right away. It's your grandma. Sounds simple enough, right? Nope. Far from it. It's your grandma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah! No. No, I don't think so. <laughs> A few takes in, Harbour began defending himself, saying, the word is so funny. When it comes to the most talked about bloopers in Stranger Things history, this is the one that takes a proverbial cake. The official Stranger Things Writers Room Twitter account dedicated a couple of tweets to honor this special moment, with one of them reading, Legend has it that David K. Harbour still can't say grandma without laughing. As it turns out, this is also one of the Duffer Brothers' favorite bloopers of the show. Nothing! There's nothing wrong with Nana! What? <laughs> <laughs> 